So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this UCL Minds Lunch Hour Lecture. We're really pleased to have you all with us today. Uh, my name's John Bridal, and I'm Professor of Evolutionary Biology at University College London. Um, and I'm here to introduce Seren in the lecture. Um, I'm very pleased to be doing that. So Professor Seren Sumner is someone I've actually known for probably like uh, 20 years now. Um, she's a fantastic scientist, and she's Professor of Behavioural Ecology at University College London. And her, her work really focuses on the ecology, evolution and behavior of insects, especially social wasps. And as I hope she'll show us today, she's working very hard to challenge societal perceptions of wasps and indeed all insects, so that they're valued in a similar way to other economically and ecologically important animals, other things that we think of as ecologically important. So I'll be handing over to Seren very soon, but just to let you know for the Q&A, um, you should have this information in your um, welcome packs, in, your, in the information for the event, but you need to open Slido on your computer, and there's a web link um, you should have in your event page, and we'll be taking your questions via Slido, and uh, to join that, as I say, look in your event information, and you enter the code LHL2, and that way you'll be able to both ask your own questions, but also vote up questions that other people have asked. So. Please do that during the lecture and as questions occur to you, feel free to, uh, to either vote the ones you like um, or ask your own questions. We welcome any questions that you'd like to hear Seren answer. Okay, so I'd now like to hand over to Seren for the lecture and I look forward very much to hearing what she's got to say. So maybe to you, Professor Sumner. Thank you very much, John, for the lovely introduction. I'm just gonna share my screen. Excellent. So I'm here to talk to you about ecosystem services of wasps. Now, probably the question you're thinking, and possibly the reason you signed up to come to this talk, is why wasps? And you are very uh, welcome to ask that question. And in fact, that's the question that I asked myself um, over 20 years ago when I first started studying wasps as a PhD student here at UCL. Um, and in fact, here is a picture of me, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, um, sitting in a culvert, um, which is a drainage ditch in the Malaysian rainforest, in the roads that go through the Malaysian rainforest. And above my head are lots of kind of tiny brown, they like stalactites hanging down. Each one of those is a wasp nest. And as you can see, there are thousands there. And on, on, on each nest, if you look very carefully, you'll see some brown blobs and those are wasps. Uh, in the middle here, there's a picture of a, a zoomed in version of that. So you can see just three, four little wasps on this nest. Um, these are hover wasps. And these are the things that I started, uh, it started my journey into uh, appreciation and love of wasps. Because I have to confess, I didn't really have any time for wasps before I started studying them. Um, and so I wasn't really, I didn't choose to study wasps because I, I liked wasps per se. It was more the questions that I could answer by, um, by, by studying them. And I was interested in animal behavior at the time and still am. And uh, studying wasps is just a brilliant way to study um, behavior, particularly of social individuals. So you can think of this um, wasp nest here as a little bit like a meerkat colony. Um, everybody loves meerkats. They're those cute things that sit up on their their hind legs as sentries in, in the African deserts. Um, and they have cooperative societies. Um, and, and actually these wasps here are just like little colonies of meerkats, but there are thousands of them, which makes them fabulous as a study organism. Um, the great thing about these little wasps is that they don't sting and they are a perfect entry level wasp for anyone who might be curious about how to start studying wasps. And that's how it all started for me. Um, then I graduated to some much more um, scary looking wasps. These are Polisti Satan. They're about two centimeters long um, and they live in Brazil. And the great thing about big wasps is that you can stick things like radio tags onto them and monitor their movements between nests. So this little tag here on this wasp at the bottom in the middle is actually one of the pit tags that you might have had injected into your pet. It's exactly the same technology. So 20 odd years later, I am still studying wasps uh, and they, my wasps have taken me around the world to the fabulous different array of species that we find. Um, and also as part of my journey, I've realized that um, just like me at the start, I didn't like wasps, 
members of the public don't like wasps, even scientists don't like wasps, even insect biologists, even entomologists don't like wasps. And so I've started a sort of twin crusade really alongside my research uh, in terms of um, bringing the wasps and, and the, the reasons to love wasps to the public. And here is a picture of me standing in an inflatable um, bee suit because you can't buy a wasp suit uh, just before I retrofitted it with a wasp waist. Um, evangelizing about the importance of wasps in ecosystems and the environment. And that's exactly what I'm doing here today for you. So people tend to not like wasps. Everybody knows that. In fact, I'm fed up with people telling me how much they hate wasps. But a few years ago, we, uh, together with uh, Georgia Law, who was a BSc student at the time at UCL, and a Marie Curie fellow, Dr. Alessandra Cini, we wanted to gather data to test whether people genuinely did hate wasps. Um, and so what we did is we uh, put together a public survey and we asked people to uh, use the words, use words to describe what they thought of when they think of wasps. And we asked them to do the same thing for bees and butterflies and flies. But I'm just showing you the wasp uh, it results here because they really bring home the problem about wasps and people. Uh, the size of the word in this uh, word cloud indicates the number of times that people use those words to describe wasps. And you can see that overwhelmingly the word sting is the pretty much the only word people have to describe wasps. Um, there are a few rude words there, don't look too closely. Uh, and it really sum sums up the kind of the way that people perceive wasps. And uh, they are the gangsters of the insect world. If you Google wasps, you will not find it hard to find this image on the right-hand side here of this saber-toothed wasp. <laughs> uh, and it's terribly unfair. I mean, wasps are really in for an uphill struggle. And in fact, this wasp hate is not new, it is ancient and it goes back millennia. And in fact, I blame Aristotle, uh, who of course is the first, uh, was the first published entomologist um, in 300 uh, BC. Uh, and in his history of animals, he writes extensively about honeybees and how fabulous bees are. And alongside that, he compares them to wasps. And this is a quote from his book, translated, uh, hornets and wasps are devoid of the extraordinary features which characterize bees. They have nothing divine about them as the bees have. So already Aristotle is setting the wasps up to fail um, because relative to their cousins, the bees, they are really not ticking the boxes of, of divinity and usefulness. And in the Bible, for example, in three books of the Bible, God sends wasps or hornets in this case to punish the unbelievers. So the fact that we all hate wasps, it's culturally entrenched in us and we are products of that, of that hate. So why do people hate wasps? Well, I think it's because they don't understand what they do. In the same survey where we ask people to use words to describe wasps, we ask them to also rate wasps and bees in terms of how useful they think they are for certain services. Now, everybody knows that bees are really important for pollination. And if this was for a talk in person in real life, I'd ask you to put up your hand and say, does anyone think wasps are important for pollination? And I can, I can bet money that you would all put your hands up. And this is essentially an, a virtual version of this, um, an online version. We ask people to rate the usefulness of bees and wasps for pollination between a scale of zero and 10. And uh, the public uh, performed well. They, they chose uh, very high scores for pollination. So up here means that they, 10 means the most uh, useful they could possibly be. And most people gave them a score between eight and 10. So the public understand that, wasp, that bees are important for pollination. When asked the same question for wasps, however, um, the public were extremely undecided. They couldn't decide whether they would be very important for pollination or very poor for pollination. It was pretty much a random distribution. When we asked people um, about the service of predation, which is catching other insects, for example, um, the public again performed exemplary um, they showed that they understood that bees are not carnivores. Bees do not hunt prey. They scored bees as very low in terms of their usefulness in predation. 
Um, but then again, for wasps, they are pretty much undecided with the whole spectrum of, of answers given, although there was a little bit of bias towards the wasps potentially being a little bit more useful for predation than bees. But overall, what this tells us is that people don't know why wasps are important. Because what I'm going to tell you now is about the real importance of wasps as predators. So to get to the bottom of convincing people, that's the public, scientists, everyone, that wasps were, had a value. We have to have a, we have to put a value onto a, a natural commodity in order to want to conserve it and look after it. And we do this by valuing them in terms of their ecosystem services, which is defined as how they support directly or indirectly the quality of human life. Um, and there was no such uh, survey uh, uh, of the literature until uh, a couple of weeks ago when um, Ryan Brock, who is a master's student in my lab a few years ago, and again, uh, Dr. Ali Cheney and I scoured the literature for evidence that wasps had a useful role in ecosystems. And we divided them up into these four different categories. So regulating services are, as the picture depicts, the, uh, the, 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 the regulation of insect populations and also pollination. Supporting services are things that support the environment like earthworms tilling the soil, or in this case, we're gonna be talking about wasps dispersing seeds. Um, cultural services, how uh, do these insects um, provide us with uh, enrichment in our own culture and usefulness? And then provisioning services, what are the products of wasps that are useful to us? So if we take the bee as an example again, we are well, uh, well, well keen, we're very keen on this, the provisioning services of, of bees because they provide us with, at least honeybees provide us with honey, and of course bees in general provide us with um, uh, the pollination services. So going through these different um, traits of uh, uh, ecosystem services, the top one is of course the regulatory um, services of the wasps as nature's pest controllers. Now, there are over 30,000 species of hunting wasps. So these are the wasps that sting. They're the wasps that catch prey to feed to their offspring. And perhaps if I were to ask you to name a creepy crawly, that you hate um, or fear more than the wasp, it might in fact include things like spiders, cockroaches, or if you're a garden, perhaps it's caterpillars or aphids. Um, and you may well fear these even more than you do wasps in a particular uh, scenario. Um, so wasps are predators of all of those types of insects. And the predatory power of wasps has been well regarded for actually over 150 years. But what what was missing from the literature was um, a, a kind of a synopsis of all the evidence that wasps were indeed important. So with uh, Ryan Brock and Ali Cheney, we, we scoured the literature for um, uh, records of wasps hunting particular types of prey to find out what type of prey they ate. And these are the food networks, uh, predator prey networks that summarize those data. So the red uh, are the wasps. So on the uh, left-hand side panel, on panel A, these are the solitary aculeate wasps, so the solitary stinging wasps, uh, which actually represent about 98% uh, of all stinging wasps. Um, and then on the right, we have the social wasps. And these are the, the different subfamilies of the social wasps. The prey orders are in the blue and the size of the node indicates the number of species in that order that were identified as being prey of particular types of wasps. So let's have a look at the solitary wasps first. Um, and solitary wasps are actually renowned for being thought to be prey specialists and in fact if you look back into um the very old uh wasp books that were quite a few of them from the early 1900s and the late 1800s um they even they even structure the book in in terms of the um the cockroach eater the uh, grasshopper eater the uh the caterpillar eater um and so they 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 depict these wasps as being prey specialists so it wasn't a surprise to find out that that was indeed the case for many types of these wasps. So, for example, the pompilids, which are these fabulous uh, wasps with big, long, curly antennae, um, hunt only the spiders. 
and and they need to be they need to be really specialist specialized in their way of hunting and they skit across the ground which is what you need to do if you wanted to um, hunt a spider um, the crab ronidae on the other hand is a very diverse group and they actually um, hunt a wide array of different prey so each line that connects these wasps to the blue boxes indicates records that have been um, recorded on uh, of those prey predator prey relationships so overall yes solitary wasps do appear to be um, uh, specialist hunters but there are some groups which are are break that rule and that they are more generalist now, there's something about the life history of solitary wasps that I think it's important that you understand because that helps us understand why these insects are prey specialists. So a, a solitary wasp will hunt a prey, so like a spider, it catches the spider alive, paralyzes it with its sting, so it has a venom that is specialized, that has co-evolved to paralyze a particular type of prey. And then it takes that prey back to its burrow, often underground, and it'll bury it in the ground with an egg on it. And that egg will hatch, that wasp egg will hatch and devour the living larder of the prey underground. So the, the mother has no further parental care. She seals it up and says goodbye, moves on to the next one. And so the wasps need to be, have been very, under very strong uh, evolutionary selection to produce not only a really specific venom that will be good at paralyzing the prey, but also a whole suite of preservatives like antibiotics to be able to keep those prey uh, fresh uh, when they abandon their offspring with them, because there's nothing, you wouldn't leave your kid at home with a freezer, with a fridge full of moldy food. The social wasps, on the other hand, the picture is very different. They are definitely prey specialists, uh, generalists, sorry. Um, there are three subfamilies of social wasps, the Polistinae, which include things like Polistes wasps, but also all the um, swarm founding wasps that you find in the near tropics. Um, the Stenogastrinae, which were my entry level hover wasps that live in uh, Southeast Asia. And the Vespinae, which probably includes the wasps that you're most familiar with, things like the yellow jacket wasps and the hornets. And as you can see, with all three of these subfamilies, they eat a wide range of prey. In fact, there are 20 different orders that we identified here, and they're not all invertebrates. These are um, uh, tadpoles, actually. They're, they were, they're, 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 they're frogs. Um, so what you can see here is that these social wasps are prey generalists. And again, their life history helps explain that. Unlike the solitary wasps, the social wasps don't necessarily use their sting to hunt. They might use it to kill the prey if it's a particularly unruly, but they don't paralyze the prey. They kill it on the spot, chop a bit off, fly back to their nest and feed it to their carnivorous uh, larvae in their nest. And so there's no need to preserve the food at all. And so by not having to, uh, needing to have a really <clears throat> specific venom and to be able to preserve your prey, that's possibly released these wasps into uh, a, a much wider food niche that they can actually um, hunt a much wider range of prey and be much more opportunistic. Um, so they are prey generalists. So collectively, the solitary and the social wasps, the evidence is that they are, have the potential to regulate the populations of lots of different types of insects or uh, invertebrates in natural and farmed ecosystems. And I've highlighted using asterisks here, the groups that are solely hunted by solitary wasps or, or by social wasps. So you can see that the two types of wasps are actually complementary. There are services that social wasps provide with, um, in terms of population regulation that solitary wasps don't and vice versa. Okay, so the other type of uh, um, uh, regulating service that wasps provide is their role as pollinators. Um, and if you remember, uh, the public did very well in uh, scoring the usefulness of bees as pollinators is very high, but they had absolutely no idea about wasps. It was rather random. Now, as it happens, there is a very well studied group of wasps which are obligate um, pollinators of orchids. So these are the thinidae wasps and they have this beautiful story of co-evolution with these, um, these orchids. The orchids mimic the back end of a sexy female wasp and the wasp that you see on this flower here is actually a male and he thinks he's copulating with that with a lovely female wasp but in fact he's been duped by the plant 
And just at the back here, you can see, if you can see my cursor, the yellow blob on the back here, um, the plant is cunningly dabbing a blob of pollen onto his back and then he'll go on to the next flower and there you get pollination. So this type of pollination, uh, fact, uh, obligate, it's the, the, the flower depends on the wasp for pollination is actually quite well regarded. What is less well regarded and understood is the role of wasps in pollinating more generally. So again, we gathered the data from the literature on um, events on records of wasps on flowers. Um, and this is, the, <laughs> this is the crazy figure we came up with. In green are all the different um, fa uh, plant families and the darker the color, so the more blue, um, the more um, records there were of those of wasps on, on those flowers. Uh, and the lighter the color, the, the less records there were. The Vespidae are the social wasps, and you can see the myriad of species of plant, of families of plants that they visit. Um, and these are the solitary wasps on the uh, right hand side here. And here's those orchid uh, pollinating wasps, which have this very strong association with the orchids, orchids there. Um, so I guess the overwhelming pattern here is that wasps visit a lot of different flowers. Now, just because they visit a flower, it doesn't mean that they are necessarily um, pollinating that flower. Um, because of course, especially if they're visiting a large diversity of flowers, it may well be that they don't visit the right species of flower um, more than once. So, in so we're very much at the, uh, the beginning of understanding the uh, pollination uh, value of wasps because we don't actually know how effective they are in terms of pollinating. But what we can be sure about is that among these 33,000 species of hunting wasps, there are specialists who are obligate pollinators. Um, they're mostly orchids that benefit from this. Um, we counted 160 species. But there are also generalist pollinators, uh, where it's a facultative association between plants and wasps. Um, and we counted almost 800 species of plants from across over 100 families of, um, families of plants. Uh, but as yet, we still lack um, a concerted body of research to know how effective these wasps, these generalists, are in terms of pollination. There is a really uh, a nice study which shows that um, in a greenhouse setting, Polistes wasps can be just as effective as bumblebees are um, in pollination. Um, so there is at least the, the beginnings of the suggestion that these wasps could be uh, very important as pollinators. Okay. Um, so let's move on to the supporting um, services. So uh, supporting services, the one I want to draw your attention to is what's called Vespicocori. Now, any of you myrmecologists out there will already know that myrmecocori is of course a word used to describe how ants carry seeds and disperse seeds. And they go for the, they carry the seed, they collect the seed because they benefit nutritionally from the eliosome, which is a very proteinaceous um, appendage onto the plant, onto the seed that they then eat or feed to their brood. And they disperse the seed, they discard the seed itself in the process. And Myrmicocori is a very well regarded ecosystem service performed by ants. Vespicocori means seed dispersal by wasps, and it's hardly reported at all. But in the literature, we were able to find 12 different social wasp species that had been um, noticed doing this, and they were dispersing the seeds from 10 different plant species. And there's one that I really want to draw your attention to, which is the Vespa velutina, which is the Asian yellow-legged hornet. And those of you in uh, Europe will uh, be familiar with this. Um, it's a recent invader in the south, southern parts of Europe, and it is um, occasionally spotted in the UK in the summer. And it's an invasive species that is out competing uh, native uh, uh, European hornets. But in its native zone in Asia, it's a really important as a primary disperser of the seeds of Stemnotuberosa. And in fact, it can take those seeds up to 110 meters away from the plant. And if you want your seeds dispersed as a plant, then you want them taken as far away from the parent plant as possible to avoid competition. So that's an incredibly long distance. And in fact, it's even further than many ants disperse seeds. Um, the wasps are thought to be complementary to the ants, uh, ants ecosystem service of seed dispersal. And there are reports that wasps will even um, cheekily steal a, uh, a seed from uh, an, an ant that's carrying it and uh, take it on a little bit further. So there may be some kind of indirect 
association there that makes them even more complementary to the services provided by ants. Okay, now let's move on to the cultural services. I'm so sorry, I have to check the time because I lost track of the time here. Um, so the kind of cultural services I want to talk about are the role of wasps as biological indicators. Um, so in what, it's really important that we are able to monitor biodiversity, especially at the moment, at this time when we are destroying habitats faster than we can um, monitor them. Um, certain types of species of wasps are important um, indicators of degraded habitats, like this Miscocitrus um, species found in the near tropics. And also um, they can be important in indicating high uh, vegetative diversity. And these are two species of, um, two genera of swarm founding wasps, Polybia and Pseudopolybia, with their presence indicates a high diversity of uh, vegetation. Some species of wasps are also useful for as potentially as monitoring environmental contaminants like heavy metals. And the reason for this is that during development, the wasps, if they're exposed to heavy metals, it can affect the melanization on their faces. So for example, the black marks on these wasps can be altered, can be fragmented under conditions where there's high um, heavy metal content. So it's potentially they have a role, a usefulness in telling us about contaminants. And then finally, some work that we're doing in our lab at the moment is uh, looking at the gut contents of larvae. Now, the wonderful thing about a, uh, a wasp larva is that they don't uh, poo, they don't excrete until they pupate. So if you grab a larva out of a wasp, uh, wasp nest, you can um, whip out the gut, which is this black thing here, and you can sequence the contents of it using metagenomic sequencing. And that tells you what species that larva has been fed, which could be an indicator of the biodiversity in that area. And then finally, the provisioning services. So here we have a, a zoomed in um, photo of a wasp nest comb. And they've got lovely hexagonal uh, cells here. And inside is a very juicy, succulent looking larva. Now, if you're one of the 2 billion people in the world who eat insects on a regular basis, you may be starting to salivate at this point in the talk. Um, because yes, insects are an incredibly important part of uh, human nutrition, and um, particularly in, um, in Asia and parts of the world. Um, and you can buy them at markets. And um, we looked into the, uh, just to find out what, what role wasps have in this entomophagy. Uh, culture, and we found that at market about 5% of the insects consumed were in fact wasps, and this included 98%, 98 species um, across 19 different countries. So wasp larvae, just like other insect larvae, are very high in protein, low in fat, really nutritious, um, and in Japan they are so popular that you can pay up to $100 uh, a kilo for a wasp nest. And the other great thing about um, insects and entomophagy in general is that they're a much more sustainable source of protein than, um, than the livestock that we tend to, um, we tend to uh, rely on, in, in our, in, certainly in Europe. So for example, the uh, feed uh, product conversion ratio is 12 times more efficient for, protein, for producing every gram of protein from a, um, an insect larva than it is from beef. Um, and then another provisioning service provided by wasps is their medicine cabinet that they contain within their bodies. Uh, so the geophagy means eating or earth, uh, insect earth means the eating of insect earth. So earth products which are, uh, are manipulated by insects. So that includes things like termite mounds. Um, and in certain parts of the world, uh, people do in fact eat the clay of these insects' nests. And this potter wasp, her, her nests um, in Africa have been found to be very high um, in antibiotics and also in the types of minerals that you might go to, for, to the pharmacy if you're pregnant, for example. They're very high in zinc and, and iron. And indeed, pregnant women and children will eat these little pots that nest inside their huts as a source of nutrition. Another un, a relatively untapped uh, area of, of what wasps have to offer us is their venom. So the very thing that you hate wasps for could in fact be a, a, a whole um, pharma, pharmacological cocktail cabinet um, that we, we, we should be making more use of. Um, the venom, as I said before, contains antibiotics, um, some of which have been shown to be effective against uh, um, 
bacteria that affect humans. Um, and more recently, there's been a few papers that suggest that the, uh, some of the peptides in the venom are called mastoparins uh, could be useful in killing cancer cells. Um, and that, that is a really exciting area of research. Okay, so I've given you a whirlwind tour of how the ecosystem services are provided by wasps are in fact great. There are, they, they tick all the boxes. They provide regulating services in terms of pollination and regulating insect populations. Uh, they provide supporting services through their seed dispersal. I didn't mention decomposition, but um, social wasps can strip a carcass of a bird um, clean of flesh within a couple of hours. So they have an important role in decomposing ca uh, cadavers. Um, and their cultural services as bioindicators and in our culture. And then of course, there's their provisioning services. The products of wasps are as nutrition and biomedical uh, resources are largely untapped. Okay. So in the last part of this talk, I want to talk about a slightly more, more um, speculative idea of how we might harness the ecosystem services of wasps. And I'm going to come back to their, their primary role as uh, population regulators. And the idea specifically that social wasps could be important as bi in biocontrol. Now, biocontrol is a form of using, of exploiting an existing predator-prey relationship um, to control uh, usually insect pests in agriculture. Um, and it's not a new thing, you know, actually parasitoid wasps, which aren't hunting wasps, they can't sting, but parasitoid wasps are used uh, regularly in agriculture to control uh, lepidopteran populations. And in fact, you might even bought, have bought some parasitoid wasps yourself to get rid of um, any clothes moths if you had a clothes moth infestation in your house. Now, the, uh, so, but, but the, so the, whilst the biocontrol um, uh, services of parasitoid wasps are indeed well regarded, those offered by social wasps are practically unexplored. But I'd like to suggest that social wasps have a lot of potential as biocontrol agents um, because they have very large colony sizes. So each colony of a yellow jacket wasp will have thousands of individual workers who are all hunters. So they're all out there regulating insects in your garden. I've shown that they're generalist hunters. So no matter what your pest is in your garden, they're likely to be creaming off the most abundant of species. They're central place foragers, which means that they come back to their nest all the time. So if you put a wasp nest in a field where you want them to eat the pests, you can be pretty certain that they will be foraging within about a 300 to 500 meter radius of that nest. And they also appear to fix on good prey once they find them. So if they find a, a patch of pests in your crop field um, and they like it, then they will probably keep on coming back for more. And as I mentioned before, they eat a lot of caterpillars and flies. These are two of the main groups that social wasps eat. And these, of course, are the groups that most of the uh, global economic pests, uh, crop pests uh, belong to. And the idea that wasps could be important for uh, predation actually dates back over 150 years. This is one of my favourite wasp books. I think it might be the first one on British social wasps um, by Edward Omerod in 1868. And through his book, he litters the suggestion that we should be doing something with these social wasps because they could be really useful for pest control. And uh, this is a nice quote. Uh, the practical result of destroying all of the wasps on Sir Brisbane's estate was that in two years time, the place was infested like, like Egypt with a plague of flies. So already 150 years ago, scientists were realizing that wasps could have a really important role as biocontrol agents or as regulating uh, insect populations. But we lacked um, a proper experimental trial to show that wasps can be effective. So a few years ago, I got together with a team of uh, Brazilians, um, Odair Fernandes, who's an agriculturalist, and Fabio Nascimento, who is a, um, a, a wasp biologist. They're both in Sao Paulo State in Brazil. And uh, Robin Southern was a postdoc who worked with us on, the, on, on this experiment. We took the rather lovely uh, two, two centimetre long enormous wasp, Polistes satan, which is very common in these parts of Brazil, put them in this greenhouse. You can translocate nests really easily. And we gave them access to maize plants with, um, which were infected with the uh, fall army worm, which is a big economic pest um, of cash crops across the world. 
And we allowed the wasps to, ex, uh, to access some of the plants, but not the others. And we left them for 10 days. And after that, we measured the degree to which the plants were damaged and also the population levels. And we found a significant difference between the, the plants that were exposed to wasps and the plants from which wasps were excluded. And this showed that wasps had a very effective um, impact on the damage, damage that these insects, these pests can cause and reduce their population significantly. So I think we should be thinking of this, we should be renaming this insect as the Brazilian farmer's friend. And of course, if you are able to use wasps rather than pesticides, this is to control pests, this is an all round win because you're encouraging local biodiversity at the same time. So where are we going now? Well, we're really trying to um, explore the potential of social wasps as bio, in biocontrol. And it's very much at the beginnings of this kind of research field really. But I think these wasps have particular potential in developing countries and particularly those in subtropical or tropical regions. Um, this is a photo I took here of some Ropolydia wasps in Zambia um, just over a year ago. And you can see there are different nests um, uh, from the same species, all um, aggregated together in a cluster of nests. And they tend to do this in the tropics. And they also, you'll see that they're built on a building. And wasps seem to be particularly uh, resilient to these kind of anthropogenic um, disturbances. In fact, most of my wasp field sites have been on abandoned buildings. They absolutely love the security that a structure like that is much better than a tree. It's not going to get blown away in the wind. The other great thing about um, the tropics and these uh, countries is that they have very high wasp diversity and abundance. The wasps are pretty much absolutely everywhere. Every house has a wasp nest until it's knocked down. Um, and also the, uh, the, prey, the life cycles of the prey and the wasp usually coincide because although you might have some seasonality with a wet season and a dry season, the season that's good for growing, cro growing crops tends to be the wet season and that also tends to be the time when the wasp nests are booming because of the abundance of prey. So relocating wasp nests into um, custom-made vespuaries on the edges of fields could mean that uh, they could reduce reliance on uh, pesticides and make them make very accessible to, uh, to uh, subsistence small-scale farmers who perhaps don't have um, the means to access the parasitoid wasps um, or, or the infrastructure in their country to provide those. Using your local social wasps is low cost, it's free actually. It, despite how it sounds, it actually takes remarkably little skill and training to be able to relocate wasps, you don't need to get stung. And of course it's environmentally sustainable, it means that you wouldn't want to use pesticides if you're relying on social wasps because the pesticides would also be affecting the wasps. So I've just given you one example of how we might harness one facet of the ecosystem services provided to us by wasps. Um, but we are very much at the tip of the iceberg here in terms of the, all the other things that wasps have to offer us. There are so many ways in which we could be benefiting by wasps. We are simply scratching the tip of the iceberg at the moment. It remains for me to thank all the fabulous people who've contributed to the work that I've presented today. So the ecosystem services work was with Alexandra Chini and uh, Ryan Brock. Um, the biocontrol wasp team in Sao Paulo were Odea and Fa uh, Fernando, uh, Odea Fernandez and Fabio Nascimento and Robin Southern. And then the Why We Hate Wasps team, again, Ali Chini and uh, Georgia Law. Now my kids, I have three kids, they've sat through a lot of my talks about wasps and the other, uh, quite recently, my son came up with this fabulous quote, which I think sums it up. Wasps are like parents, helpful, but annoying. I hope I have brought a little bit of wasp love to you today and convinced you that perhaps we should be looking at wasps for what they can give us. And there certainly is a point to wasps. Thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Arian, that's fantastic. Um, if you could hear everyone, I'm sure there'll be like a chorus of, uh, of applause, if it's called a chorus, I'm not sure if it's uh, a, a smattering of, of applause would be ringing out across the room. So. And thanks very much for that. We've got some questions coming up, but while people cogitate and decide what questions to put in, I might just ask you a question of my own, which is, um, you know, is it just, it seems very remarkable that given how useful wasps are, we have such prejudice against them. Is that just a European or Hellenistic thing that comes from Aristotle? Do other cultures in the world have a similar fear and 
dis- dislike of wasps? They do indeed. Yes, if you look through the sort of the local uh, mythology or, or you know religious uh, stories as well um, in countries from around the world, that wasps often feature as the the kind of the the, the temptress, the evil, the the bad thing in life. So I think it's it's certainly not just a, a European um, a European fear of wasps. Um, I think the reason why you know wasps are very understudied there's cultural prejudice there, obviously, and that's kind of fed into the the scientific efforts. So um, there are forty, I think, for every wasp paper on ecosystem services, um, uh, on the ecosystem services of wasps, there are um, forty papers on bees, for example. I mean, bees, bees are so much more uh, well studied um, than wasps. And I think, you know, the, the research on bees is incredible and really important. Um, but now is time to to kind of ride on the tailcoats of that success story of how how bees are important and how people understand how bees are important. And you know, people will go out of their way to save a bee, um, to help a bee out of their kitchen window, whereas they would reach for the magazine and swap the wasps. <laughs> it's such a shame. It's such an extreme reaction to just being annoyed at a picnic, you know, every so often. It's, I mean, because you would have thought that farmers, you know, working in the neotropics or the subtropics would have noticed that they could use the wasps as predators. I mean, at some point, are there any Aboriginal or Indigenous cultures which have used wasps in that way before? Do you know? Not that I'm aware of, no. I mean, there, the, there are some, uh, from the early 1900s, there are some, uh, pa- some scientific papers that report um, trying to use uh, Polistes wasps, for example, on plantations in, in um, the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. And they note that when they, when they actually moved, you know, it's quite quite revolutionary from, you know, these papers like 1902 and 1915, where they moved wasps onto plantations and they observed that they that the levels of the pests were much lower. So there is a, there was a little sort of blip of research interest um, in the early 1900s, but it just, apart from another few in the 1980s, it's, it's pretty much uh, not piqued people's interest at all. We should just stop eating jam sandwiches and there wouldn't be such a problem, I guess. Um, no, you can eat your jam sandwiches, you just have to give them a wasp offering at the same time. <laughs> yeah. We should revere them as gods in that case. I was, I was amazed to see that I didn't realise, I mean, I study plants, I didn't realise that there were wasp orchids as well, so that's fantastic. It's really amazing to see that. Um, okay, let's go to some questions from, from you guys then, from everyone in the audience. There's there's quite a few great questions there, but I'll just choose the first uh, rated one, which I guess I probably know the answer. Expect I know what you're going to say to this. Should we be considering including wasps as part of our diets in the future? Um, I think definitely. I think insects in general. Um, I think, you know, we don't... It, actually, there is a really fabulous um, story of... Uh, harvesting wasp larvae for food in parts of India. Um, and I really can't remember the name of the town, but there's, there's this amazing area in India where they they farm the, the hornet, the Vespa mandarinia, um, which they actually have husbandry techniques where they're able, able to work with these insects. Now, many of you may, uh, may recognize that name, Vespa mandarinia, because it is the species, it's the Asian hornet, which has been dubbed the awful name of the murder hornet um, in, in, in America when it's it started to invade there. So it is a very large hornet. It is it has a venom that dissolves your, your tissue. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, 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 the, what's, it's the, uh, the top wasp dog, if you like. Um, but there are people in India who have been farming these insects for, for decades. And they if they can work with, with the biggest, scariest wasp, then I think, you know, we should all be thinking about how we can work better with these insects. For sure, yeah. I mean, it's clear that eating insects is, I would say, is definitely the way forward if we want to have a livable economy. Let's Absolutely. go. Um, oh, there's a nice question here. So um, this is, all of these are anonymous. I'll say if, it's, if I've got the name of the person, but uh, in your opinion, what is the most fascinating wasp you've studied, Sarian? Oh, well, I'm probably <clears throat> I'm probably biased here. I, I have to say my favourite wasp is Polistes canadensis, which is the wasp that I study. In fact, it was on the, the last slide of my talk. Um, it's a very common species in Panama. And I guess that was my graduation from the, the hover wasp, which barely sting you, to the real world of wasps. And they're fascinating. They're like a they're, primitively social wasp and they represent these first stages in sociality and what you can mark each individual wasp um, separately a bit like these wasps behind me actually you can put 
paint dots on them and they all have an identity then. And then we watch them, we observe their behavior, we can manipulate them. And it's like watching a soap opera, um, you know, wasp A will beat up wasp B and then wasp B come, C comes along and getting muscles in. And it's all the, it's because they're all in conflict. They're all trying to, you know, they're all functioning as a community, as, as, a, as a nest, as a, as a family group. And yet they're all hopeful reproductives. And that, I guess that's my, they're my favorite wasps. And also they're the first, we sequenced their genome in 2015 and that was the first hunting wasp genome. So I was quite proud of that one. That sounds like a fantastic, <laughs> a fantastic soap opera you can watch basically. When you're out in Panama watching these different nests, it must be like watching five different streams of different soap shows where they've got different interactions with families trying to trying to find out who's going to get to the top, like, like succession basically maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you do get hooked on it. And it's just really sad when you, um, if the experiment involves um, genetic analyses, we sadly have to kill the insects afterwards. And it, it's really heartbreaking. Yeah, but I like <laughs> the way that you use the chips to kind of work out when they come into the nest and go out, like oyster, like kind of oyster cards, right? Just yeah, they're like, yeah, oyster cards yeah. swiping in and out of the nest. That's right, yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Okay, I better some more questions from the audience. So there is a question about fig wasps. So I'm gonna leave that for now because that's a whole nother talk about fig wasps and their relationship with fig plants. And I, I'm sure there was, I mean, there were some fantastic things there. I was amazed by the um, solitary interactions with the particular um, predators where they lay the eggs on there. But we'll come, maybe we'll come back to that question. A more practical question. Well, there's two that are kind of aligned, which maybe I'll ask together. Firstly, what caused your fascination with wasps in the first place? And secondly, maybe from that, what do you think is the best way that we can increase awareness of how useful wasps are in society? What should people in the audience do to kind of take this lesson to their friends and family? Yeah, that's a really lovely question. Thanks for asking. Um, I mean, I guess the, the way that I got into wasps is that I, I always had a fascination with the natural world. And that's why I did a zoology degree. Uh, and I was particularly interested in animal behaviour. And, uh, and I wanted to do a PhD on animal behavior. And the one that came up was on these hover wasps in Malaysia. Um, and at the time, my soon to be PhD supervisor reassured me that they didn't sting, which completely lie, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Very tiny stings, but nonetheless, they do sting. Um, and it was just by, I realized that they were a brilliant way to study behavior because so much easier than going to study a mammal, for example. Um, and you can get, you know, in terms of doing a good scientific experiment, you can get large sample sizes. And, and I, I got hooked on exactly those soap opera behaviours. Um, so I guess that's how it happened. And the reason I then started it, in fact, the work on um, ecosystem services for me has been very new um, and partly driven by people asking me, well, why do you study wasps? What's the point of wasps? Why don't you study bees or something more useful instead? And I, I, I you know, we've known for hundreds of years really that wasps do do useful things in the ecosystem as predators but we hadn't really you know put the evidence out there so for example we can put a value on the pollination value, uh, cost or the pollination value of a bee um, but we can't do anything like that for the hunting wasps so I think you know this is the sort of thing that I think we need to be uh, we need to be thinking about next um, how can we get people to uh, engage with wasps more? Um, so I think if you're in the UK um, at the end of the summer, you will have picnics outside or barbecues and you will start to get bothered by the yellow jacket wasp. And I think one way to uh, a routine for you and your families to understand and um, become fascinated with wasps is when they come and visit you at your picnic, <clears throat> just sit back and watch them. And they'll probably go for your, if it's early in the season, they'll go for your ham or your, you know, your sausages. Um, and if it's later in the season, uh, they'll go for the sugary things because at that time then they don't have larvae to feed anymore and they're looking for nutrition for themselves. So they could go to a flower <clears throat> and get some nectar, but actually your sugary drink is much more accessible. Um, but if you watch them, they're not, they're not interested in you at all. <clears throat> it's only when you start waving your hands at them and swatting that they start to bother you. Um, and I think just by watching them, you, you will become fascinated with their behaviours. Um, and I, I was reading an old um, uh, uh, book about wasps from the 1900s uh, a few days ago. And one really cunning way, if, you, if, you can't, if you're not used to picking up wasps and marking them with paint, what you could do at your picnic is that if you see a wasp on your ham sandwich, sprinkle a bit of flour on it. This is the methods these old naturalists use. And then it'll fly off and then it'll probably come back again. And you'll see this wasp covered in flour keep repeatedly coming back to your same bit of chicken um, and think about giving it a wasp offering, put that bit of chicken aside and the wasp will just go to that bit of 
food and they'll leave you alone. And I think that's the way you can sort of, you know, learn to learn to appreciate the wasps and, and observe them as, a, as an important individuals. They try and get inside their minds to some extent and see the world from their perspective. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, the, people don't hesitate to empathise uh, with with um, and anthropomorphise bees. Yeah. Uh, why don't we do the same for wasps? Yeah, because wasps are just as loving parents, right? I mean, there are just as many. I mean, I've, I mean, if you go places, I'm thinking particularly Slovenia. All of their banks have got bees as kind of symbols because of their the lessons they teach us about hard work and stuff. But why don't we have the same moral lessons from wasps? Because they, well, they work really hard and they love their, their offspring. You know, they look after them. <laughs> As I say, I come back to Aristotle. It's all his fault. <laughs> you kind of reached all humans. I mean, only a few of them. Um, there are some more questions. So some, you've answered, actually, there is this general practical question that's coming up quite a lot in the chat, which is asking, well, you know, how can we actually quantify the value of wasps as opposed to bees? I mean, you, you don't really know how much pollination they're doing, but how will we ever know that? How will we ever find that out? Well, I think to throw the question back, how do we do it for bees? How, yeah. have, we, how have we managed to put a value on bees? Um, and then we apply the same kind of approaches to wasps. And in fact, you know, we, we, we have, I think bees are worth 350, or not bees, pollinating insects are worth 350 billion um, to agriculture across the world. Um, the uh, the predatory uh, the buyer control value of insects across the world in agriculture is something like four hundred and sixteen billion dollars. Uh, so I think you know, and that completely misses out the uh, the hunting wasps. So I think you know the the methods are already out there; they're already being defined by these fields. Um, so we just have to apply the same kind of approaches. Just that we haven't measured them. We haven't measured them. No, yeah. exactly. Okay, there's lots more questions. I'm conscious of the time, so maybe there'll be one last question. Um, uh, is there a way to stop them stinging you? We've already kind of answered that question. Why, why is it that we, I mean, we all, when we think of wasps, everyone just thinks of those yellow jacket wasps, but I mean, how do we know when we see other types of wasps? Are they just really difficult to see? They don't come towards you? I mean, you rarely, I mean, people, when they see a wasp, uh, you know, when you, they think of a wasp, they think of the yellow jacket wasp or hornet. Um, but there are, as I said in my talk, there are only about 1500 species of these social wasps. And in fact, the yellow jackets uh, and the hornets, there are only about 55 species of those. The other 32,000 wasps, or hunting wasps, are solitary. And you probably mistake them for a bee. They can look quite bee-like. Um, and they just, they're very, they're very private. They go about their business and they don't really bother you. So you just don't notice them. So when we talk about wasp behaviour, we really mean 30,000 different things, essentially. All the different <laughs> well, I think, you know, well, the, the, the behaviour of social wasps is quite well studied, but the behaviour of solitary wasps is much less so. It was very popular in the late 1800s, early 1900s for the amateur entomologists to study, um, you know, chase uh, solitary wasps around. And Henry Faber um, from France, he, his, his books on, on hunting wasps are, sh show these in, this incredible fascination that people of his era had. But then they kind of just fell out of it, uh, favour, possibly because there was no funding <laughs> for research. And there's been such you know, an emphasis on funding for useful science as opposed to, to fundamental science for science sake. Yeah. Um, but, but I hope that by putting these wasps on the map in terms of their ecosystem services that will now think very differently about, you know, you might want to study solitary wasps or social wasps, not because they're fascinating, or not only because they're fascinating, but also because they do really important things in ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time you might be seeing wasps and not and mistaking them for ants and thinking or, or mistaking them for bees. I think you can say them for bees mostly, because of course ants don't have wings. Yeah, well someone's um, asked, how do we differentiate between ants and wingless wasps, or between wasps and ant alates? Which I'm not uh, sure. Yeah, so ant alates have very flimsy wings, and they will, you know, they fly, they're hopeless at flying, because it's always the, you know, they're, they're either females with enormous abdomens and they're just bumbling along trying to fly, or they're males who are just pathetic and, you know, they only live for a few hours and they mate and then they die. So you're unlikely to um, mistake them for those. There are some wasps that don't have um, wings, the mutilids, um, velvet, and they're called velvet ants, but they're actually wasps. Um, they can be, they are easily mistaken as ants actually, um, but they have a, a whopping great sting. So mm -hmm. if you did happen to step on one, you think it's an ant, but it was a really bad sting. It was probably a mutilid wasp. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brilliant. Well, that's fantastic, Sarin. So, I mean, I certainly have feel much more of an appreciation for just how diverse 
uh, wasps are not only in how they look but in how they behave and the different forms of uh, morality they can teach us and usefulness about the world so I'd recommend everyone goes out and spend some time getting to know their local wasps and enjoying their company rather than flicking them away without a moment's thought starting to appreciate what they do so I'm just going to say to everyone before we say goodbye to Serian um, just to say um, keep an eye out for thanks everyone for joining first of all it's been great to be virtually with you guys. I, don't, I haven't seen anyone really, but it's been great to hear your questions. Um, and thanks Erin very much for her talk. And you can see upcoming lectures for the UCR Minds series on the, on the webpage. Um, and I'm just gonna finish by just saying, will everyone stay well during these difficult times and hopefully we'll be meeting in person again soon. And just to thanks Erin very much indeed for a really fantastic talk. So thanks very much Erin. That's great. Thanks for having Thank me. Thanks. Thanks for sharing, John. No, no worries. Thanks everyone for joining us. Okay. Bye bye, everyone. Have a nice bye. week. Bye.